going to start with Mickey Alad coming from Technion, and he's going to talk about sparse modeling of data and its relation to deep learning. OK, good afternoon. Uh, what are the limits in terms of moving around? Are there limits? OK. So um, I'm going to tell you about a bridge that uh, me and my students are building, slowly building, on the connection between sparse modeling of data and deep learning. In fact, what I'm going to present today is a theory for the architectures that we are using in deep learning. And this theory is based on sparse modeling of data. So let's have a little bit of context to this statement. Um, bringing theory to deep learning has been the holy grail of data sciences. It's all clear. This is the theme of this event. Um, and. Uh, there already is a growing volume of work that accumulates and bring theory, but what we have are small pieces of a puzzle, and those pieces are not even connected. So there is a lot of work to be done here. What we are co contributing is another chapter, if you like, another few pieces in this puzzle. And, and we know that what we are bringing is limited, but also uh, bringing a different flavor, which I would like to expose to you. Of course, the dream is to come up eventually with a complete theory for deep learning, something that will might happen in. 10, 20 years, who knows? Um, I don't think I need to convince you that we need deep learning. Some people do question this question, uh, this uh, this issue, because you know deep learning is successful, so why bother? Um, we do need theory for deep learning because we do need to understand the limits of this uh, beast, the, the 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 abilities that it has, and uh, and also we would like to remove this general feeling that many of us have that deep learning is dark magic. I don't know how many of you know this story about Ali Rahimi. In 2017, he stepped to the floor in NIPS, and he gave a lecture. And in his lecture, he viciously attacked deep learning for being alchemy, the alchemy of current ages. Uh, it, it is amazing because at the time, in the meantime, he left Google. But at the time, he was working in Google. And Google is the shrine of deep learning. The answer came a few days later by Jan LeCun, who said two interesting things. Two, I would say, even brilliant things. First, I am not resisting theory. Go ahead and bring it. We would love to have it. We're just running to do whatever we can. And anyone who can bring theory, welcome. The second thing is, Jan Likun mentioned a bunch of fields in which theory came only after the practice. So the practice in deep learning is already here and quite vivid. And as we move on, we will see that theory will catch up and explain things and take us to the next levels. So um, how do you build the theory for deep learning? As I see it, there are three pillars on top of which you build your explanations. The first are the architectures. The choice of the architectures we make, uh, you can talk about their ability to approximate families of functions. And we have seen such language here. Uh, you can talk about properties of those architectures, their tendency to preserve distances or something else. We can talk about algorithms. When I'm saying algorithms, I'm referring to the loss function and its structure. I'm talking about the SGD and the hidden uh, re regularization inside it. I'm talking about training, optimization, generalization. All of it falls under, optim uh, under algorithms. And then we can talk about the data. And few speakers here spoke about the data. I will mention here the work by Bruna and Mala about invariances in visual data and how you treat them by the architecture that you are working with. <laughs> or the work by Rich Baranuk and his students, and we have seen a glimpse of it in the lecture that was here just uh, an hour ago. And what, what Rich did was to propose a generative model that explains how data is generated. And from there, he basically deduces the architectures and the deep learning concept. In fact, the work that I will be presenting today is very much aligned with this approach of uh, Rich Baranuk. It's just that we have a different generative model, and therefore we have different claims, different statements. In fact, if you look at the participants of this conference, you will see that each and every one of them has their own specific angle to how to approach the theory of deep learning. And I tried to map this for you. As you can see, many of them are concentrated on the green zone, on algorithms. It's, it's interesting, I agree, generalization, training, it's fascinating. But look, the data, I would claim, is critical. We have to look at the data because you have to understand, we are not feeding neural network with anything. 
we are feeding neural network with very specific data structures. And the question is, how does this influence whatever we do? This is the take we have. We will start with the data. It will have some statements about the architectures. We have nothing to say yet about algorithm. Here is an interesting observation. You look at the languages people use to explain deep learning, you see something strange. People use control theory, uh, information theory, signal processing, uh, quantum physics, partial differential equations, um, so many things, harmonic analysis, many different languages. I have a good friend, Ron Kimmel, who said that deep learning is just like a dark monster covered with mirrors. Everybody looking at it sees himself reflected. And so you see yourself and you think this is your language exactly. This is how it should, do, should be done. And then David Donahoe came and heard that and said, those are not regular mirrors. Those are Cinderella's mirrors. They talk back to you and they tell you that you are the most beautiful. <laughs> and I'm telling you, this is part of the reason why we don't have connections between explanations of deep learning because everybody thinks that his answer is the only one valid and the rest is just crap. And having said that, our, t our work, and when I say our, <laughs> when I say our work, no, actually, actually I meant the other way around. Okay, I'll jump ahead and tell you that our work is the best. Okay, the work I'm about to present was created by four PhD students of mine, Yaniv Romano. He is now a postdoc at Stanford doing, working with Manuel Candes. By the way, he's searching for a position. Vardan Papian uh, did his uh, PhD with me and he's doing his postdoc with David Donahoe and by the way, he's searching a position. <laughs> Jeremiah Sulam, who did his PhD with me and he is not searching for a position because he started searching for a postdoc and he found a position in John Hopkins. And Aviad Abraham, who is still stuck with me and yes, our work is the best, okay? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to start by uh, explaining the concept of sparse modeling of data. This is something I've been working on for 20 years. I kept trying, escaping this field and it keeps pulling me back. Uh, so 20 years of work. Then I'll talk about uh, uh, a descendant of it, which is convol uh, convolutional sparse coding, a very specific case of sparse land. And that will take us to the multi-layer CSC and don't, be wor don't worry, all of this takes us all the way to deep learning. You'll see how I'm connecting this to deep learning. So this is obviously the main message of my talk. The second message has to do with the fact that all three are generative models, just like I mentioned about Rick Baraniuk's uh, work. And generative models are amazing. They are amazing because they give you ability to design algorithms, which means designing architectures, and also analyze them theoretically. And as you will see in the slides here, I will do both. Okay, so let's, let's start. Eventually, I'm going to explain to you something called the multi-layered convolutional sparse modeling. So what I'm gonna do now is to pass it into words, explain one word at a time, and this way I guarantee that I do not skip anything. So let's start by talking about modeling. We are processing data. All sorts of data sources, they are quite diverse, but they share something in common. Each and every one of them in its own way has structure. And this structure, if you think about it, is everything we do in signal processing, image processing, machine learning. All we do is to identify this structure and exploit it in whatever we do. So how do you find the structure in a given source of information? One elegant way of doing it is using models. What is a model? A model is basically a set of mathematical or logical rules that you impose on your data. You basically bring those equations, tell the data you have to behave along these lines, okay? And this is something we do all the time. In image processing, let me tell you, everything we have done in the past, I don't know, 60, 70 years, is all about models evolved over time and everything around them. Basically an evolution of models. And if a new model comes to the game, it has to, it has to comply with two forces that are contradicting. The first is the model should be simple because the model itself being simple implies algorithms that are simple. But I can always tell you that my signal is zero. This is a lovely model, of course, very simple, but of course useless, so I have to be reliable. And there is a tension between these two. And one other thing that keep, people keep forgetting is that there is no notion of a correct model. There is a, a notion of better model, more accurate model, but models by, by their definitions are always wrong. They're always carrying some sort of error with them. 
I will not talk about that, but this is a critical issue. So this talk is about models because they are everywhere. They are covering practically everything we do. And specifically, I will concentrate on models that are based on the, the concept of sparse representation, sparse land, this is how I call them. And then we will see that their descendants are explaining deep learning or portions of deep learning. So this was the story of modeling. Now let's talk about sparse modeling. Just before I'll describe what sparse modeling is, let me first describe where it comes from. So it comes from knowledge that has been accumulated in signal processing in the context of uh, wavelets, but not just wavelets, transforms in general. It is relying on concepts taken from approximation theory and tools that are taken from linear algebra and uh, optimization, a lot of optimization. And yes, it has some flavor of machine learning in it because we will be introducing a model. The model will have parameters and we will have to, to tune the model in order to fit the data and that is the learning part of it. And this model has been taken to long, long list of tasks in signal processing, image processing, machine learning, and it was quite successful. I would say that somewhere between 2005 to 2012, it was the choice, the best choice. But then something happened. Deep learning came in. Deep learning came in and started winning any contest. And what I'm trying to, to tell you today basically is deep learning is actually our small brother. It's related to sparsity. So it's, the, it, nothing has changed. Okay? This would be the message. So what is this model? How does it find structuring data? Let's illustrate this on patches of size 8 by 8 in images. Imagine that I'm taking a bunch of natural images, many of them, and I'm extracting all the patches of size 8 by 8 and I'm trying to figure out where, are, where is the structure in these patches. Okay, so imagine that someone helps me and gives me this set of patches. I'm calling this the dictionary. This is the dictionary. It has 256 elements. I'm referring to them as atoms. Each and every one of them is a patch itself of size 8 by 8. And now comes the model. And the model says, listen, this patch and all the others in this corpus of patches can be represented using a few, a combination of few atoms from this dictionary. So this patch is a combination of only, in this case, three atoms from this dictionary. You take away the word few and you kill the model. Because if you allow me to combine any number of atoms, I can combine 64 of them that span the whole space and I can recreate anything. So what am I telling you? Nothing. But having only few cover your patch is, is, a, is a statement. There are two notions here that should be taken, should, should be looked at, um, um, sparsity and redundancy. I started with a patch of size 8 by 8. The first thing I'm doing is to convert it to a vector of size 256 because now I have to tell you how much in each and every one of those atoms is involved in its creation. So I'm creating a representation and it is redundant, longer than the signal. But hey, most of the elements are zeros. In this case, only three are non-zeros, so it is sparse. So we have a sparse and redundant representation. And in fact, in this specific story, only six numbers carry all the information about your patch. Why six? Because you have to tell me who are the atoms and how much each of them contributed. Six numbers instead of 64. This is the dimensionality reduction that is so typical to models. Models are always trying to convince you that the data is way simpler than you think. You can think about it as the chemistry of data. Just like in regular chemistry where we have the fundamental elements and we have a molecule that is always a combination of only few of them, our signals are a combination of only few atoms from the dictionary. And here is uh, uh, the first step to, to make things a little bit more formal. So this machine is going to generate signals for us. And in it, we have a memory. And in this memory, we hold the dictionary. Now the dictionary is held such that every column is an atom. So in our story, every column is of length 64. And we have 260, uh, 256 of them. And now I'll press on the button here, and a sparse vector alpha will be created. Magic. And alpha multiplying D combines few atoms from D in order to generate your signal X. And I know this is crazy, but from now on, I believe that this is how signals are created. This is the sparse land model. Okay. I told you before that models should be simple. Is this a simple model? Let me show you that actually this is an intricate question. Imagine that I have. Um, a dictionary with 2,000 atoms. 2,000 atoms is not too much, not too many. And imagine that I take this dictionary and I'm combining 15 atoms that I've chosen and I'm creating a signal and I'm bringing it to you and I'm telling you, 
find me who are the atoms I've used. Do the atom decomposition. What do you have to do? You have to sweep through all the possibilities of choosing 15 out of the 2,000, and this will take you forever. It will take you forever. So how do you work with this model if the most fundamental question of breaking down a signal into its atoms cannot be solved? So what do we do? Just before answering this, let's, uh, let's have a look at this exact problem, but from the formal point of view. What I basically told you is that I give you the dictionary, I give you the signal, and I'm actually asking you to solve the linear system of equations. But this linear system of equations has infinitely many possible solutions. You are supposed to find maybe the sparsest one, the one that has fewest non-zeros. Now, how do you do that? This is how we formulate it. This is the number of non-zeros in the vector alpha. You are searching for the sparsest solution that is feasible. Sometimes we work with a relaxed version of this problem where instead of forcing equality, we force y to be epsilon close to d alpha. Fine. The thing with these two problems, they are both NP-hard. You cannot solve them just because of the reason I've shown you before. So what do we do? We approximate. We approximate. We use greedy methods. We use relaxation methods. We have algorithms. Let me talk briefly about these two algorithms because I will be using them later on. Basis pursuit. Remember what we are trying to do? You give me a signal Y and you gave me the dictionary D and I'm trying to figure out who is the alpha that will create a, an approximation of Y up to an epsilon error. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay, basis pursuit basically said, this is Jen Donald Saunders, 95. Just replace the L, L0 with L1. Suddenly the problem is convex, it can be manageable, it, it, it can be solved in fraction of a second. You can do it and hey, hey, it works. This is what they tell us. The other option, thresholding, is really a dumb algorithm, really dumb algorithm, which basically does uh, uh, multiplications of the atoms, matched filters, basically. You match your atoms with a signal, do inner product with them, D transpose times Y, and search for the large coefficients. So you pass these values through this thresholding function. Small values are nulled, big ones are left intact, and this is your approximation. This is the thresholding algorithm. Good. Do they work? Let me show you. So remember this story about 2,000 atoms? Here it is, 2,000 atoms. 15 of them are turned on. And now I'm running the basis pursuit, this L1 option, and I'm getting this solution. And it's a perfect solution. Is it a coincidence? No, it's not. And this is one of the beautiful parts about this field of sparse representation. We can actually prove that under some conditions, the problem is not really NP-hard as it may seem. You can actually guarantee that basis pursuit or other algorithms will succeed in finding the solution. So let me show you one such theorem because I will be leveraging it later on. For that to be done, I need to explain something called the coherence. It's a property of the dictionary. You give me the dictionary D, I'm normalizing the columns, and now I'm multiplying D transpose by D and I'm getting D transpose D, this gram matrix. The main diagonal are all ones, the atoms are normalized, and the off diagonals are the ones I'm interested in. I'm basically searching for the maximal inner product between two atoms. This is mu, the coherence. The smaller it is, the better. Of course, it cannot be zero because you cannot expect the columns of D to be orthonormal. They cannot be, there are too many of them. And uh, all the theoretical results I will be showing today will rely on this coherence. Those of you who are familiar with this field know that there are other measures of goodness of a dictionary. I will not talk about them. Okay, so back to our story. Someone ran this machine and generated the signal. A sparse vector alpha multiply D to create X. Lovely. You don't get to see X. You get to see a noisy version of it. The noise is of bounded energy. That's all you know. And now you are trying to figure out for the given signal Y, who is this alpha that generated it? Why am I doing this, by the way? Because this alpha, if you find it, can help you clean the signal, can help you compress the signal, can help you, re help you recognize things. It, it basically is the entry door to anything you want to do on this signal. So here is what you will do. You are, you are going to search for the sparsest alpha to explain y up to an epsilon error. But I told you, you cannot do that. So you will be replacing this with L1. I'm running now with basis pursuit. And now the question is, how close is this alpha hat to the original alpha? So here is one such theorem. And it says, by the way, theorems will appear this way, and the dark text is not to be read. OK? So what you see here. What you see here is that if this alpha here was sparse enough, and notice the influence of coherence, the smaller it is, the better the condition, then I guarantee you that alpha hat is not far away from alpha, which is good news. 
a uh, few words about this theorem. First, if there is no noise here, the problem doesn't become easy. The problem is still NP-hub. I told you before, it's tough. Well, if epsilon is zero, I'm getting that alpha hat minus alpha is zero, which means that I'm nailing exactly alpha, the original alpha, which is terrific. This is one thing. Second thing, this is actually quite a pessimistic theorem. There are better theorems, way better theorems. It's just that they will typically tend to speak in terms of probabilistic claims, and they are harder to, um, to present and explain. And this is a theorem for basis pursuit. There are many pursuit algorithms. I've mentioned just two, but there are many pursuit algorithms, and each comes with its own guarantees. Even the thresholding has guarantees. Of course, weaker ones, but does have one as well. Okay, we are talking about difficulties with this model, and we just solved the problem of atom decomposition. Apparently, we can run uh, approximations with some safety. Here is another difficulty. Where do you bring the dictionary from? I mean, I'm working on, with face images. Someone else is working with financial data. A third person is working with audio. Each one of us will need a dictionary, a different dictionary. How do you do that? So what do you do? We, we are learning the dictionary. You have to learn it from data examples, searching for the best sparsifying dictionary. There are a bunch of algorithms out there. Without this, you have nothing. You cannot work with this model. We will talk about it briefly, mention this briefly as we run, but it will always accompany us. Okay, and if we are counting difficulties, then why, why should you believe that signals are created as a combination of atoms? It, it sounds strange. Why, why would you believe that this is of universal flavor that can it, it can treat all sorts of data sources? So how, how do you answer this? One option is to say, I tried, I'm using this model, I'm relying on it and it works for me, which people has, have done. And the other option is to say, I, actually I understand this model geometrically, I, I, I can relate it to other models. For example, you know that this model is nothing but a GMM, but a GMM with exponential number of Gaussians. Okay, this gives me a lot of insight now, because GMM is something I feel comfortable with. In fact, this model has a very interesting flavor of describing manifolds. Just that these manifolds change orientation from one place to another. So there are many ways to look at this. The bottom line is, there are questions, but there are also answers. And this model works well, and people have been using it. When it comes to image processing, how do you practice this model? If my image is of size 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, so 1 million pixels, are you expecting me to hold a dictionary that has columns that each of them is of million entries, it will be impossible to do. So what people has, have done is to work with patches. Impose the model on patches. Basically, you break the image into fully overlapped patches. You bring the model to describe those small patches, 8 by 8, 10 by 10. And then once you finish, you pile them back and aggregate them. So basically, there is an underlying assumption here. And the underlying assumption is, you know what? If, if your image is a valid image, here is what I expect to happen. Every patch in it should have a sparse representation, every patch should have a sparse representation with respect to a common dictionary. And this is something we have been relying on and doing things, and for a while it was fun. And then in 2008, 2009, we started asking ourselves, what is it? What, what are we doing here? What kind of model are we assuming? It took us some time, and then, come, then came Vardan Papian, the person I mentioned, my student, and he gave the initial answer that actually took us to the next chapter, which is the CSC, the Convolutional Sparse Coding. So just to recap here, when I'm working with large images with global signals, I am basically assuming a local model on the patches, assuming that every patch in the signal has a sparse representation, and all of them are sharing the same dictionary. Okay, so let's move now to the Convolutional Sparse Modeling, um, our next chapter. Um, until now, it was background material. From now on, I'm starting to dive into recent papers. This is a paper from 2017 that um, deals with generalizations of the Sparsland model to CSC. Okay, so this is the model, and it basically says the following. Your image is basically sum of convolutions. And this sum of convolutions is built of small filters. You can think of each of them as, say, 7 by 7, okay, small filters. You have m of them, in this case, 16. And each of those filters is convolved with a sparse map. The sparse map is of the same size as the image. Okay? And please don't think about boundary issues. It's not an issue. It's always solvable. So I'm convolving filters by sparse maps. 
I wish I could have told you that I invented this model. I didn't. I'm not sure who invented it. Uh, maybe someone in the audience know. I don't know. But I think that Jan LeCun was definitely dominant in the very beginning. Do you know? No. Um, it was very dominant in the beginning and using it. And I think this was the main inspiration for the convenience. Let me show you this model from a different perspective. So this model, and now I'm moving to 1D signals just to simplify things. So we have a vector x, and it is the sum of multiplication this time. Multiplications where uh, ci's are matrices, square matrices. If this is a local filter, then this is ci, a bend in the circulant matrix. And in fact, when you multiply by ci, you convolve. This is obvious. And this matrix will be multiplying the vector gamma i, which is a sparse vector. In fact, those 2D maps that are sparse simply stretch to become 1D. And now, ci multiply gamma i. And if this is true, then you can write everything a little bit different by concatenating all the ci's together into one fat matrix, multiplying by a long, long vector, which has to be sparse. So here is a dictionary times a sparse vector, creating your signal. It's a special case of sparseness, OK? Why special case? Because this matrix is not anything. It has a structure. In fact, here it is. This is how it looks like in the case of three filters. <coughs> OK. In fact, I typically uh, work with a different structure of this uh, matrix. I take all the first atoms together, all the seconds, etc., and I'm creating this sliding block structure where all those uh, rectangles are of the same content. OK? And let's call them DL. DL is of size n, the number of elements in the filter, times m, the number of filters we have. And this is our dictionary. OK, now why are we so fascinated about the CSC? Here is the reason. This is the CSC model. And now let's extract a patch in location i. And when I'm talking about a patch, it should be a patch of the same size as the filters. So a patch in location i is basically all this stripe multiplying gamma. But all this stripe contains a lot of regions that are just empty. So basically, this is the active part. This is the part that truly really does any multiplication. And it multiplies this vector, a portion of the big gamma. Let's call it the stripe vector. So this is the stripe vector, and this is the stripe dictionary. So I can write down that rix equals omega times gamma i. OK, nice. Now I'm moving one sample down. One sample down, taking the next patch. It overlaps with the previous patch. Moving down, omega shifted m elements to the right, and you get omega all over again here, multiplying gamma i plus 1. Gamma i plus 1 here is simply shifted m elements down. So I can write down that ri plus 1 x equals omega times gamma i plus 1. What am I showing you here? I'm showing you that the CSC model believes that every patch has a sparse representation with respect to a common dictionary. So CSC is the global way of explaining what we kept doing without understanding. OK, so armed with this, we came back to the CSC model and asked ourselves, OK, does the theory that we have developed for sparse land apply to this model? Does it apply? Let's try. I've shown you a theorem just a minute ago that tells you that if you're searching for the sparsest representation to explain why up to an epsilon error, you can run the basis pursuit, L1. Right? And if you do that, you will succeed if the number of non-zeros is sufficiently small. Well, how, small, how big is this bound? Let's see. If you take just two filters, this is the simplest case. Of course, if I take more, it will worsen. If I take only two filters and their length is 64, you will end up with coherence that cannot be below this value, which means that this bound is 4. Basically, I'm allowing you to combine only four atoms, four filters somewhere in the image in order to generate the complete image. Forget about it. It's impossible. The image is rich. It contains a lot of content. This is saying nothing. The theory collapses, so we have nothing. So what do we do? We came back to our uh, understanding of the CSE, and we noticed the following. We don't care about the number of non-zeros in all this vector gamma. Remember those gamma i's? Those are the representations of the patches. Those should be sparse. So now let's invent a new notion of sparsity. The notion of sparsity is sweep over all those gamma i's, search for the most populated one, and say this is the number that characterizes the density or the population of this vector. This is the notation. L0 norm because I'm counting number of non-zeros, L infinity because I'm doing max over all these numbers, and S here for sliding or stripe or something, I don't know. 
Okay. So I'm now reinventing my problem. I'm searching for the locally sparse vector, the best locally sparse vector to explain why up to an epsilon error. Terrific definition. The question is, can you solve it? And can you explain theoretically what to expect? And this is what we did in this paper I mentioned. And to make a long story short, we generalized all the theory, and I'm going to show you one typical theorem just to give you a flavor. And so here is the theorem. And the theorem says, you are, you are about to run the basis pursuit. Notice that this is the basis pursuit with a slightly changed structure. It's the Lagrangian form, where instead of forcing this to be epsilon, I'm penalizing for it. But still, this is L1 and L2. And here is the theorem, and it says, if gamma is locally sparse enough, look, look, this is the same bound, or almost the same bound as before, say four, but this number now corresponds to number of non-zeros in one of those gamma i's, or in each, each of them. If your gamma is locally sparse, then basis pursuit will perform very well. In what sense? It will find an estimate that is not far away from the true estimate. It will identify the dominant non-zeros. It will do good. How many non-zeros am I allowing in the complete gamma? Huge number of them, because every stripe may have these number of non-zeros. Of course, they are overlapping. If you do the calculations, you end up with order of n, order of the number of pixels in the image. Definitely a lot of atoms can be merged, and still the theorem holds. Great. So this was the CSC, and now I'm coming to the highlight of this talk, which is the MLCSC, the multi-layered convolutional sparse modeling. And I'm referring to these papers, two, two papers, and things that came on top. This is the CSC model, and I still believe in it. I'm telling you that if you give me a signal, an image, I believe that it is a convolutional dictionary times a sparse vector. Now it is D1 times gamma 1. Why D1 and gamma 1? Because obviously there will be D2 and gamma 2, okay? And here it is. Now I'm telling gamma 1, hey, gamma 1, you are not just a sparse vector. You yourself is the outcome of yet another CSC model, okay? So there is another dictionary of a CSC structure, D2, multiplying gamma 2, which is expected to be sparse. Everything, every, everything I say about sparsity is local sparsity in the spirit of what we have done before. And of course, you can proceed this way, have several layers. You don't have to stop in two layers. This is the model. Let me give you a little bit of intuition about it. When I'm showing you this equation, I'm basically telling you, listen, your signal is creation is, is, is a combination of few atoms from the dictionary D1. This is the meaning of this equation. But now when gamma 1 is D2 times gamma 2, I'm telling you something new that comes on top. It basically tells you X is a combination of atoms of D1, D2 times gamma 2. Because gamma 2 is also sparse, I'm combining now atoms of D1, D2. Now who are those atoms? Let's take D1 and multiply it by the first column of D2. What is it? A combination of few atoms from D1 creates a new superatom, or let's call it a molecule, that is the element, the first elements of D1, D2. All the other elements will be the same. Combination of atoms from D1. And now this equation basically tells you X. You are expected to be also a sparse combination of molecules. So we get different description, different levels of abstractions of describing the same signal in several ways. Just like, look at me. I'm a combination of atoms. Definitely. I'm a combination of molecules, why not? I'm a combination of cells, yes. I'm a combination of tissue parts. You can, there are many ways to describe my body. All of them are correct. If you tell me all of them together, you give me more information, and this will reduce dimensionality furthermore. And this is the essence of this model. Here's another way of looking at this model. If I have k layers to it, I can write down that x is d1 times d2 all the way to dk times gamma k. So there is an effective dictionary multiplying gamma k a dictionary multiplying a sparse vector, creating a signal, and this is a special case of sparse land, a dictionary times a sparse vector, creating a signal. In fact, the effective here has a CSC structure. It has a convolutional structure. It's a linear model. It, looks, it is a linear model, but now comes the, the, the interesting thing. I'm forcing all the intermediate representations, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, all the way in. All of them are forced to be sparse as well. And each one of them carries a little bit more information for us. And we are doing, we are working with all. Okay. And just to give you a little bit of more intuition about this model, here is how the atoms look like for the MNIST. So we train the dictionary, obviously. What you see here are the filters generating D1. Remember, D1 is a dictionary of convolutional filters. It has 32 filters. Here they are. What are they? 
just edge detections of all sorts. You want to create your digit, you will have to combine hundreds of those in order to create a digit in MNIST. Fine. Now let me show you D2. Now I cannot show you D2 because D2 is a boring matrix. I will show you D1 times D2. Here it is. These are the atoms of D1 times D2. What you get now, look at this for example. You get curves. So you will have to combine several dozens of these in order to generate a digit in MNIST. If I move, if I move to D1, D2, D3, these are the structures I'm getting now, complete structures. You will have to combine only a few of them to get a digit. And I'll come back to this example. Remember what we have done when I described sparse land? I described how the model think the signal was created, and the first thing I did was to come up with the atom decomposition. Basically, you give me a signal, and I'm supposed to find who are the atoms building it. So let's do the same here. Let's do the same here. So basically, I have all the dictionaries. You give me a signal X, and I'm searching for the gammas to explain it. Before, it was only a single gamma, but now I have a bunch of them. So all of them are unknowns, and I'm going to find them all. Okay? This is a pursuit problem. In fact, just like before, instead of thinking exact equality, let's allow epsilon deviation. So basically, I'm taking a signal and projecting it onto the model up to an epsilon error, and I'm wondering who are those gammas. And, and we are about to solve this problem. Okay. Just before solving this problem, let me show you how it actually works. So if this is my signal y, then this is the projection x. This is d times gamma 1. D1 times gamma 1, look at, D1, look at gamma 1. It has 213 atoms. Those are the small filters we had. You have to combine nearly 200 of them in order to generate this digit. The same x, the very same x, can be created as D1, D2 times gamma 2, which has only 30 non-zeros. Why? Because they are more, um, um, I don't know, more structured. They, they are covering more regions, and they can, can merge into creation of this digit. If you go with D3 now, you have to combine only five atoms to create the very same X. So X carries three different descriptions. Each of them tells us a story about it. And together, the story is compelling and hopefully something that we, we can work with. So coming back to the design of pursuit algorithms. I have now a pursuit problem. Let's solve it. And remember, what is the simplest pursuit algorithm we have out there? Thresholding. So let's rely on it. Let's start with it. So <clears throat> I remind you. If there is a dictionary multiplying a sparse vector and there is some sort, of, some sort of noise in addition, then my way of finding gamma or approximating gamma would be to take the signal y, multiply by d transpose, and threshold. Now, how do you threshold? There are a bunch of options here. There is the hard thresholding in blue. There is the red thresholding, the soft one, soft thresholding. It's basically related to L1. And there is the green one, which corresponds to the soft under the assumption, if you have such an assumption, that you believe that the coefficients are non-negative. Sometimes our models do come up with such an assumption on top. So this is the, the, the thresholding algorithm. Now let's deploy it. And here it is. Here, is. here is how it will work. I'm going to do it in a layer-wise. I'm going to forget about all the other layers and think about only the first layer. You gave me a signal y. You believe that gamma 1, a sparse vector, can describe it. So what I'm going to do is to take y, multiply by d1 transpose, and threshold. And I'll get an estimate of gamma 1. This is an estimate of gamma 1. Now that gamma 1 is given in my hands, I will multiply by d2 transpose, threshold, and get an estimate of gamma 2. And this is the layer thresholding. What is it? This is feedforward regular convnet. Convolutions, ReLU, convolutions, ReLU. Same thing. So what I'm telling you basically is that when you are running a network that has this structure of cons values, you are essentially running a very dumb pursuit algorithm. In fact, you are believing in the model that we have described and running on top of it a specific, threshold, a specific pursuit algorithm. This is not the message of the work. Here is the message of the work. We have a machine that generates signals. We have an hypothesis about how signals are generated in, inside it, right? We have some equations that we believe describe how signals are generated. OK, you might take this signal and add noise to it. Fine with me. I'll take it and feed it to an algorithm that will try to figure out who are those gammas that generated your signal. Which algorithm? The one I've just shown you, for example, the thresholding, the layer thresholding, which is what? Which is a neural net. Or maybe something smarter. And we'll come up with something smarter later on. But there is something that I can do that no one ever could do before. I can ask, 
under what conditions this is going to succeed. So we have here a network, a deep network, and I'm asking under what conditions will you succeed? What should happen here in the generator of the signal so that you work well? And I can ask similar questions such as what, your, what is your accuracy? How sensitive you are to noise? And all these can be solved mathematically. In fact, let me, let me show you one such theorem. Okay, so here's a theorem. And the theorem says, referring to the previous slide, if those gamma i's that generated your signals are sparse enough, look, they are supposed to be locally sparse enough. If your gamma i's are locally sparse enough, and this is a horrible expression, then here is what will happen. If you run the layered heart thresholding, one of those versions I mentioned, I guarantee you, you'll find the correct support. This is amazing. I will find all the locations of the non-zeros in all the gammas, all through. I'm not guaranteeing the values, not at all. I'm actually sure that I'm not getting the values right, but I'm getting the locations right. If, for example, classification relies on location of atoms, identity of atoms, I'm, I'm done. This is great. Okay? So what do we have here? Local conditions of sparsity guarantee success of a neural net of specific structure. Okay? The bad, bad news here, several of them. This ratio here is killing us. This ratio is not an artifact of the proof. It's actually a, properly, a, a, a proper element that comes because of the thresholding. Thresholding is sensitive to noise in a horrible way. And this ratio is the smallest non-zero divided by the maximum non-zero in each stripe. And it is uh, uh, reducing the bound to the point where maybe it's almost saying nothing. So this is one thing. Second thing, this darkened equation, it's time to read it. It's actually showing an error that is propagating and growing from one layer to the next. Why is it growing? Because we are dumb. We, we worked layered wise. We shouldn't have done that, but we've worked, we, we search for something simple. So the error is getting bigger and bigger. In fact, not only it is getting bigger, even if your signal doesn't have noise, it will be created by this machine. Okay? So there are some bad news. Can you do better? Of course you can do better. I mean, why are we stuck with the thresholding? Let's move to something smarter. Let's move to layered basis per suit. Again, layered, which already means I'm doing something sub-sub-optimal, but okay, something smarter at least. So the idea would be <coughs> go to the first layer and solve for the basis per suit, find the estimate of gamma 1 with L2, L1. Having found it, take it as a signal and now solve for gamma 2. Chain of basis per suits, okay? When we saw that, we saw... Nobody ever thought about it. And then we discovered a paper in 2010 that does exactly that. They, based on intuition only, they said, here is a convnet. Let's replace every layer by a basis per suit. It will do better. And they have shown that it does better. So we are suggesting this because we are thinking per suit. We, we know our model. We know what we are after. OK. And how does it perform? We can analyze it theoretically, not so hard. And here is the theorem. And the theorem says, if those gamma i's that generated your signal are sparse enough, and now look how more civilized the condition is, then I guarantee you that the layer basis per suit will perform well in a bunch of, math, bunch of uh, uh, aspects. The main of them is the fact that each of the gamma i's will not be far away from the true gamma i, which is good news. Okay? Remember the bad news from before? Contrast is no longer an issue. We are not sensitive to the noise as we were before. This is great. Um, if there is an error in the signal in the beginning, it will create errors as we go, and it will propagate. But, but if there is no noise in the beginning, all the estimation will be perfect, which is great. OK, so this is the layered basis per suit. Now, what stands behind the layered basis per suit? Let, let, let me show you what actually is the network that we are running here. Imagine that I have a model that, have, that has seven layers. So my model has seven layers, so I need to solve seven basis per suits. Now, how do you solve a basis per suit? One elegant way of doing it is to solve, uh, to solve it using iterative algorithms such as ISTA. ISTA basically is an algorithm that uh, iteratively multiplies by the dictionary, by the transpose of it, adds, subtract, and thresholds. And you do that. Now, unfold this, say, 50 iterations. Every basis per suit is 50 iterations. I have 50, another 50, another 7 times 50. I'm looking at a network. Its depth is 350 layers. And this network is basically seven basis per suits. And it looks very much like ResNet, very much like ResNet, but very specifically tailored to do whatever it's supposed to do. Now, let me jump ahead and tell you, we ran this network on all sorts of problems. It worked great. 
it gives results that are up on par with state of the art. So it really is a network that works. More than that, in my network here, I don't have 350 sets of parameters to find. Every 50 parameters are shared. Every 50 parameters are using the same dictionary and dictionary transpose. So the network is quite simple, way simpler than you think. Okay. Two things and I'm finished. Where are the labels in my story? Where are the labels? I mean, we are, we are talking about deep learning. We are always talking about supervised learning. So where are the labels? So one possible answer is there are no labels. We are in the mode of unsupervised learning. Forget about labels. We can actually work with this model just as we work with a single layer model. We are imposing sparsity. This is our driving force. And yes, you can do that. It will amount to, if you think about it, some sort of an autoencoder. Another answer is you want, la uh, you want labels? I can give you labels. Now imagine that this machine generates a signal and immediately as it generated those gamma i's, it creates the label using this formula. Basically linear combination of the gamma i's and the threshold. Now I have per each sample that has been generated an accompanying label. And now I can ask all sorts of questions. For example, now it makes so much more sense to do the pursuit problem because now if I do the pursuit and I'm finding good gamma i's and I'm plugging them into this equation, I'm likely to do good classification. So here is a good reason to do, to do the pursuit appropriately. In fact, you can ask terrific questions such as what is the maximal noise that you can add to x while still guaranteeing that your label estimate will not change? That means how strong am I to adversarial noise? And we have such a tool. Another question that comes with this work. Remember what I told you before? This work starts with a modeling of the data and I delivered. I gave you a model for the data. And then I shown you how it creates architectures to work with. And those architectures, we know what they do. We have understanding of what they are expected to do because they are pursuit algorithms of the model and we have some guarantees on top of them. What, do we do, what, what don't we have? We don't have anything to say about learning, training, generalization, nothing. Nothing. Where is the learning? The learning is basically finding the dictionaries, essentially. And this is actually true for all those three models. If you work with any model, you will need to find the dictionary. And there are dictionary learning algorithms, and there are, there are also works that are suggesting theory of dictionary learning, basically tell, giving you guarantees to succeed in finding a dictionary under some conditions. When it comes to the sparse model, we have many algorithms for training, and some papers, let's say 50 papers, that are touching on this question of give me a guarantee for success in finding the dictionary. As we come to the CSC, we have a bunch of algorithms for training the filters. We have hardly no theory. As we move to the multi-layer CSC, it's a new thing. So it's only the algorithms we develop, two or three of them, and we develop them only because we wanted to see if this works, and we have no theory. So this is definitely a missing part in this. I'll come, I'll, I'll take questions in a few minutes. So in this talk, I described a data model and specifically based on sparsity. From there, we moved to the convolutional sparse coding model for which we have uh, developed a new theory of explaining uh, prospects of success of pursuit algorithm, etc. Uh, from there, we moved to the multi-layered uh, model, um, which has been shown to be connected to convnets. By the way, forget about convnets, nets, because anything we have done here immediately uh, generalized, generalizes to, to fully connected networks easily. Just forget about CSC, go straight to sparse learning. And there are two take home messages. The first one that I mentioned, all these three are generative models. And being generative models, you saw what it enabled me to do. Gener generating algorithms and analyzing them. This is really strong. The second take home message is of course this connection to deep learning. The connection to deep learning is fascinating. Um, and, and, and I truly believe that when we are looking at architectures that we are choosing to work with, they are not arbitrary. They are not just out there because someone guessed them. They are coming from the strong intuition that has a lot to do with modeling of the data in one way or another. Um, what I've described to you is relatively old work. It, it was done a year and a half ago at least. Since then we worked hard. We did all sorts of other things. We extended uh, um, the work in different directions, finding dictionary learning, 
talking about holistic pursuit. Why, why do, should you do the pursuit layer-wise? Do, do it holistically. We worked on general, generalizing uh, uh, basis pursuit to the multi-layer and basically developing new LISTA and ISTA algorithms, um, adversarial attacks and their analysis. I told you about that. And uh, we did all, things, all, all sorts of other things that are more um, practical and has to do with things that emerge from this work, such as designing of dictionary learning algorithms for CSC, um, um, variations of CSC. Uh, this paper that is about to appear in NIPS basically suggests a new architecture for image denoising that is based on the CSC but thinking MMSE estimation and it gives state-of-the-art results. And uh, the most recent work was in 2006, we came up with a concept of image denoising using KSVD. I don't know if you know about this work. It is yet another algorithm for image denoising. It was working fine. It was the best for three days at least. And then competing work started to come and we, well, we vanished. We, we came back to this algorithm now that we are armed with all these insights and we said, let's unfold this algorithm and let's train it supervised. It's the same algorithm. It's just that the parameters are set differently. Suddenly it works so much better. Really truly competitive with the best of them. So this is something else. On a personal note, and I know I have, I'm biased. I worked for 20 years on sparse representation, so you don't have to believe me, but I truly believe that sparse modeling of data is at the heart of deep learning. Architecture that we are using are strongly related to it, and I think this is one of the main avenues for entry of theory to deep learning. And this is what I believe in, and this is how I work. This is how I drive my students to death. Um, and if I believe in sparse land, and if you believe with me, then there is a, a MOOC that I created under edX, basically teaching, um, uh, teaching this, um, uh, this topic from end to end. And this is it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bunch of questions. Don't give a chance to Arrow to kill me. Your gammas kept getting sparser and sparser. What's to the point where you have no non-zero elements? Well, it, okay, so the question was, in the example I've shown you, the gammas were becoming sparser and sparser. Uh, will they get to the point where they are empty? Of course not. If gamma becomes empty, then uh, we have nothing. Remember, it's the same signal that should be represented using, uh, using different uh, scales or different uh, levels of abstraction. So uh, this is why we had only three layers. There was no reason to go deeper. The next layer will simply has the digits as the memorized. Ero, please, yo. Be before I kill you, yeah. <clears throat> that was a great talk, beautiful. Um, and I love the idea of sort of flipping everything on its head and saying, you know, let's make a linear model for the generative part and then we'll use a nonlinear procedure to arrive at to in the forward direction as we're analyzing signals. It's, and it's, of course, it's the same thing as the original sparse coding idea from, from the mid-90s, uh, but it's beautiful to see it kind of laid out in, in this context. So I want to understand two things. One is um, you, you started to say that uh, the simplest procedure for doing, doing uh, or arriving at the coefficient is just thresholding, but obviously there are much better procedures and there are things that are more accurate and there are things that are going to behave better under different kinds of noise and there are presumably things that are going to behave better in a multi-layered uh, formulation. So can you say just a little bit about that? Did you arrive at a new kind of nonlinearity, of something better than a ReLU? Or can we get rid of the oh, ReLUs no. finally? Oh, no, so the ReLU stays. The ReLU stays, but it now gets expanded but in 50 all layers. all the jumpers and all the, all the feedbacks in the, in the network look different. I see. This is this is exactly the paper I so was referring to. Connections. I was referring to uh, uh, the second paper, the whole no, sorry, the third paper on multi-layer basis pursuit. What we have done there is to to create a penalty function that has the uh, the, the likelihood regularization on gamma one and regularization on gamma two, and then solve it holistically and show that it gets to a new kind of ISTA algorithm. We okay. took this ISTA algorithm, unfolded it into a network, trained it, and it works great. That's great, and I'll look forward to looking at that paper. And Tell one me. last question, which is a concern, is just that in general, the problem with the sparse models, it always seemed to me, is that they're, uh, they're not so good at tracking things that are continuous invariances. So if I imagine continuous deformations in an image, 
and you're going to model that with a small number of discrete basis elements, you're not going to do so well when you have these small deformations. And I'm wondering how invariances show up in your networks if you train The them honest answer is I don't know. Ever since I spoke with Stefan Malay about this work, I'm, I'm, I'm troubled by invariances and where do they fit in my story. And I don't really see, because it, it's such a different language that I don't seem to bridge between his view and mine. And no, I, I don't I think I need to go to you. continuum, but, but it's, it's a riddle. I think you do, but I'll, we'll talk about it later. Ah, okay, you think about your continuous basis per suit. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very nice talk. I have a question. So you mentioned that when you use the basic pursuit approach to train the neural network, you do it layer-wise. And then later on, you have the holistic way to train the network with basic pursuit end-to-end. Can you elaborate more on the holistic way to do that? Uh, there is no board here. So I'll give you the equation verbally, OK? So. In basis, well, you know what, let, let's, let me find an equation that I am stating the basis per suit and that will help me. Oh, come on. Okay, look at this equation here. Look at this equation here, okay? And now, um, um, think two layers of my model. So I will write down here d, d, d2, d1, d2, d1? No, d1, d2 times alpha minus y. This will be this expression. Here I'll have alpha, and I'll have another L1 norm on d1 alpha. So it's a new optimization problem and it needs to be solved. And now if you think about it in the language that we are using, this is an analysis and synthesis problem. It's tough to solve. What we did is to come up with an algorithm, iterative algorithm that resembles ISTA, resembles ISTA. It has some guarantees. We developed some guarantees. It was a, I have to stop here and say, this is a joint work with Amir Beck. We really, really ne needed his abilities in optimization. And once the algorithm is written as a set of equations, as, as basically as an iterative equation, we unfolded it to create a network. And from there on, you just tra train it supervised. This is our way of learning the dictionaries. We eventually, we learn, diction learn the networks. And it works great. It works great in the sense that when it, it is plugged to data sources, that C410, et cetera, it is working, touching the ceiling. like that, then I guess you only like one iteration per layer, so there will be some air accumulation, right? Do you have any like guarantee for the air at the end no, of no, the network? No, 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 so when I'm doing the basis pursuit, I'm doing finite number of iterations, say 20, 50, but I'm stopping somewhere and I'm training end to end. If I do only one iteration, you know what I'm getting? The thresholding algorithm again. Oh, I see. So you have like, you repeat the block like, multiple times. I'm repeating, the, I'm repeating the iterations. Yes, I, I'm unfolding. This is the unfolding effect. Yes, thank you. Time, one more. One more. Uh, you mentioned briefly at the very end that the general, you mentioned briefly at the very end that this all generalizes to fully connected networks and not just the yes. convolutional. Um, but a lot of these results are based on the ratio of, you know, the size of the latent state and the, and the number of measurements, right? The, the m over n, right? The compression ratio. Okay. Um, doesn't that get, that get right? If you can't remove, right? If you don't have zeros on all these columns stretching from the different sides of the convolution, right? Mm -hmm. So when you had these, when you first defined these d's, um, let, let, let me say something here. Mm -hmm. I could have done, I, I could have created a shorter version of this talk where I'm des describing sparse land and going straight to multi-layered sparse land. Mm -hmm. I chose to, to go through the CSC and the MLCSC to talk about convenance. Yeah. But if I go straight from sparse land, I'm talking about fully connected networks. Mm -hmm. And all the theorems that we have in regular sparse land apply here, and we can use them. Th this is what I meant. And it okay. appears in one of those papers I mentioned. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. All right.